Welcome to the Legendary Upside Podcast. My name is Pat Corain. Uh, today I am joined by Daniel Raz and Kyle Dvorak. We are going to be discussing the Legendary Upside best ball rankings, which you can find at legendaryupside.com, along with the rest of all my content. We're going to be uh, kind of just like, this is going to be kind of a behind the scenes call, and I just like kind of just made it a podcast. Um, we want to just sort of give everyone a sense of where our head's at with the combine now underway, but uh, you know, the, the big positions for fantasy aren't until tomorrow. We're recording this Friday, so we're going to get some tight end testing later today, but then running back quarterback wide receiver, not until tomorrow. So kind of want to just get our thoughts out there before a ton of chaos ensues. We'll be back soon with another post combine pod, but yeah, guys, how you doing? Excited to talk some rookies with you. Yeah, going yeah, well. Good. You know, Daniel, are you back stateside? You've been—I feel like you've traveled so much over like since no, the off season. Uh, still in London for the next three months. So I'll have to wait oh, to Christ. do my first best ball draft in June, or maybe late May. So we'll see. But I'm still hard at work getting the rankings as efficient as ever. When did when did DraftKings drop last year? Was it right after the draft? Because I think I'm I'm almost positive there. You can draft those. Oh, I don't know. Their user interface is so bad. I'm not even sure I would want to. <laughs> yeah, I bet you I, break down. I bet, I bet you're drafting. I was going to say, like, this, right now you're like, oh, it's just DraftKings. I won't want to. Then May 1st rolls around. You're itching your skin. You're like, oh, come on. I just need to just give me one $10. Come on. I mean, maybe some U, UFL DFS to like, just onslaught the DC defenders passing attack. But that's probably as degenerate as I might get. Yeah, yeah, just that. The, not just, anything just really little. degenerate. I mean, if the sportsbook or DraftKings offered tackle props on the UFL, I might indulge, but I don't <laughs> think we're there yet. All right, so I uh, I mentioned that we're going to be talking rookies, which we obviously will, but I think it's actually interesting to talk through some of the veteran stands that we've taken thus far. And, you know, this kind of serves as like a little bit of a check in point of the early draft period. You know, we're kind of like halfway through the early draft period, sort of, you know, it is the bit one of the big information points anyway. So yeah, we're just we're just shy of we're about a week and like nine days out from the legal tampering period of free agency, right. which is really it's the start of free agency. So this is like you said, it's a uh, combine, then free agency. So this is our kind of final check in before we get two big waves of news. Exactly. And, we, you know, we, we get veteran based news. I remember last year, um, you know, Matthew Berry does his combine piece where he gets all the rumors from the combine. Um, and one of the big ones was Jerome Ford was they were like, they really like yeah, Jerome yeah. Ford. He's locked in as the number two guy. And, you know, I think we'll get hopefully some good actionable stuff, you know, in terms of the the veteran you know, which veterans are in good standing and, and likely to to have locked up the number two roles or whatever. I mean, that stuff's really, really helpful. And you get a lot of uh, those kind of rumors. And um, you were sharing some stuff. The NFL, I haven't listened yet, but the NFL Stock Exchange guys were talking about some of the kind of early free agency rumor stuff that they're hearing. So uh, we'll get lots of, of, we already are, and we're going to get lots more information coming out of the combine with that. So let's start with some veterans here. Keenan Allen is a guy that um, Daniel was bringing up right before we recorded is someone that we're completely even with the with ADP on. But like feels like someone maybe we should be slightly more bullish on. What do, what, what do you think, Daniel? Yeah, I think with Keenan, we have concerns about Greg Roman, the overall volume of the passing attack. It's tough to tell whether the market has baked that in. I'm was led to believe that just no market in March would be thinking about team play volume enough. Pat <laughs> kind of was arguing that, you know, the sickos there actually might be thinking about how bad the vibes are, but I think. Yeah. Cause the vibes are there. I don't think volumes always top of mind, but vibes are and the volume vibes, <laughs> the volume is vibing in, in LA right now. Yeah. And we're pretty confident. I'd say near 99% that Keenan will not be cut, which is a pretty big thing. If the market yeah. were 100% sure that Keenan wouldn't be cut, and also that Mike Williams might be cut or just not play most of the year on his ACL recovery, that outcome I think is more likely than him being back with the Chargers. 
Keenan's ADP would rise. So I think there are so many avenues for Keenan's ADP to rise. We also collectively think the Chargers are not as likely to take Brock Bowers as the market indicates. And we think wide receiver is equally, if not a little less likely than the market. So because of all the avenues to having his ADP increase, I think it might be prudent to get a little ahead, especially when you look at other receivers like Michael Pittman, who if you're comparing Pittman and Keenan, there should be like very few categories that Pittman wins out on for a one year outlook. And yet one has an ADP of 29 and one's going in the early fourth round. Yeah. Honestly, even if we didn't think Keenan's ADP would rise, like I'd be fine just saying like, yeah, we're not getting like closing line value on him. He's just mispriced given that like, all we've seen from the past two years, he hasn't played the entirety of the past two years, but when he's been on the field has been like elite PPR, half PPR production. And now we think they're probably, I think it's probably more likely than not that they don't have Mike Williams for this year or the ACL lingers and he doesn't play for four to six weeks. So like the games played projection for Mike Williams is like, four or five given that he's already we know he's probably not playing some plus the fact that i think he's not a he's far from a lock to be on the roster i think keenan allen's outlook in this team even if the vibes are bad is like elite target domination still really strong efficiency despite his age i'd be fine just being ahead of adp throughout the summer if it didn't really move at all what about dk metcalf that's kind of an interesting comparison point um like Metcalf, we also, I mean, it's sort of hard to tell how much volume concerns we have with Metcalf. Um, but, you know, kind of the the clear number one, but he's not going to have the target dominance that Keenan could. Um, but, there, you know, it's just like a little bit more, it's less of an extreme range of outcomes, I think, with Metcalf. Would you guys rather have Allen or Metcalf? Oh, Keenan, like, easily. Okay. I'd go slightly Keenan. I think if we pass the draft and Seattle doesn't change their quarterback room, then it becomes a near coin flip for me. But if, as it exists now, there's still a chance that Seattle either moves somewhere in round one up to take McCarthy because it seems like he won't be there at 16, or they add someone on day two, then that really makes the risk that at the late season when they have a rookie quarterback in and are yeah. presumably eliminated from the playoffs that you don't want many pieces of that passing offense at an overpriced ADP, but that's a little bit of a niche outcome. No, but that is definitely a real risk. You, you don't, you know, I mean, some of the quarterbacks are kind of interesting, but I, I still, you don't really want to be shifting to a rookie quarterback in the fantasy playoffs. It's, it's generally not ideal. Um, Okay. Michael Pittman, you brought up, I'm going to go ahead and share the rankings here. Um, so I did a little bit of a refresh on the look of the site. If uh, if people go to the site right at the top now, the, the rankings are pinned. So uh, the Dynasty and Big Board rankings are pinned right there. So let's go ahead and um, check out the rankings. I think I did this. The ID, ID shouldn't be on here. It's, I mean, it's fine, but, you know, it doesn't look great. Um, all right. Let's talk Michael Pittman. Um, we're 11 and 11.2 spots behind Pittman on, uh, in, in terms of the ADP, we've got him at 40, his ADP is 28.8. This has been one, you know, a fairly big stand for us in the, a fairly big stand on a wide receiver in the early rounds, which is not our typical move. And yet I feel really good about this one and i think we're gonna keep this one unless you guys have any big pushback but like i just i don't really get the michael pittman love right now Th part of it for me was that early i was like oh he's a free agent so he could go somewhere else he could you know end up we he's seen the ability to dominate targets he could go to a, a strong passing offense now but he's not he's gonna end up back in indianapolis and everything we saw from anthony richardson confirms what we kind of thought which is that he's going to be really fun for fantasy and is not accurate so i don't really get why you would want to be investing a top 30 pick in his kind of volume dependent wide receiver one i mean Pittman is not hyper explosive i'm not trying to take anything away from him but he's kind of like you know possession receiver plus type of guy where 
he can for you know a lot of his value in, in, in fantasy is going to come from getting a ton of targets consistently um I, you know he's not that dissimilar from like Drake London and we see what Drake London Drake London in a super low volume passing game has trouble performing week in week out um this could be you know somewhat similar situation and he's going ahead of where or where London was going last year so and honestly I think London's probably better so anyway that's that's where I'm at on Pittman. What are your guys' thoughts? Yeah, I think you articulated it pretty well. The comp with London's also interesting because one of them might have a veteran pocket quarterback throwing to them, and one might have us, and one will have a sophomore quarterback with accuracy question marks. He could be be a much improved passer this year. We don't know. The market's pricing it as if that is known, and it's just similar to what they'll get with Gardner Minshew last year. But what we're looking at with Pittman this year feels like a dead zone running back equivalent at wide receiver where a lot of the issues that you don't want some of these Uber volume dependent running backs where skill is either questionable to acceptable, but nothing near exceptional. And I think that's exactly what Pittman is. And he's priced. I mean, I think he's priced at least around too high and really struggle to understand what the market sees unless they're ignoring all the factors that are changing. Yeah, I wanted to come in like a contrarian and be like, he's, well, contrarian on this show and be like, oh, I he's wanted young. to do as well. I, I know, like, I, and I, I tried. I just I was, don't agree. I, know. <laughs> and I was like, well, one, like he's young and productive and the market sort of agrees that he's good. Why are we deviating from that? But like, I, I agree that he's good, but like he's good, good enough to produce in what we think this offense will look like next year. We also think Drake London's good and good was not good enough for Drake London. I doubt they'll be that horrifically run heavy but just the amount of dropbacks that will probably be converted to rush attempts and the amount of like rush attempts as in scrambles and also rush attempts as in literal rush attempts uh it seems like an uphill battle for michael Pittman, who was good last year he was like 22nd in yards per out run 20th in pff receiving grade but he's not great and i think a lot of times it over it takes greatness to overcome these sort of low volume situations and at this point like we've got a lot of data on who he is he's probably just very good and and probably not great right yeah so in the early rounds we have other stands um outside of Pittman, but they are generally running backs um before i guess you know maybe we, we should talk to Vontae adams who actually i i think adp's kind of moved a little bit to where i, d- I didn't feel like we had a big stand on him and yeah uh, of the wider of the early wide receivers he's like the first one uh, and the only one really outside of Pittman that we have a big stand against until you get down to Devontae Smith um, Mm -hmm. or a bit behind ADP on him. Adam scares me because he's still good. Like he's, he he definitely still has it, but meaning what is their quarterback situation? Yeah. I think we've been getting breadcrumbs from Antonio Pierce, who in all his interviews is incredibly outspoken, probably to the detriment of their strategy, but it's very refreshing for us trying to glean information. He's talked about how if they're pursuing a rookie quarterback, they want to be uber aggressive. It's been mentioned a lot, but he was the recruiting director at Arizona State when they recruited, along with a litany of recruiting violations, Jaden Daniels. So if they (laughs) are comfortable with him, they're definitely willing to trade off. They hired Luke Getze. So I think their two biggest avenues to new quarterbacks in Daniels and in the fields, as well as even Drake May. Like, we like Drake May. We think he'll be fun for fantasy. You still wouldn't love your top 10 NFL receiver going into a rookie situation, even if we have more confidence in the rookie being good. So I, I'm not sure who Vegas is, pro- who the market is projecting Vegas to have at quarterback, because it's not Aiden O'Connell and it's probably not Jaden Daniels or Justin Fields. So unless they get. Uh, Kirk Cousins, Unless I they, think it's tough. Yeah. Yeah, I mean the the thing about so rookie the rookie quarterback thing is interesting because Adams is so good that I could see him, and he's so good specifically at getting open and earning targets. You know, like he's even if he's not what he was like three or four years ago, I still think he's he's really really strong there. Um, that he could very easily be like a quarterback safety uh safety blanket so the big thing for me with the rookie quarterback stuff is like 
which ones would actually hurt passing volume. And it's the two most likely. It's McCarthy yeah. and Daniels. Yep. So that's part of the reason I think the rookie quarterback thing is is, is a concern. Um, and then if it's not a rookie quarterback, like, I guess, feel, like, is Fields – intriguing to you at all for for Adams? I mean, I I would feel a little bit like, oh, I wish I had more Adams, I think, at this price if Fields were to go there. Really? I I don't like feel like... Just because it's not going to be a disaster. Like, the quarterback play will have its its moments. Uh, Well, you're talking about Justin Fields. Fields. How confident are you? It won't be a disaster. Yeah, I mean, God bless his heart, Justin Fields, but like, a very poor. You more just like put up fifty points last year. I mean, I'm saying there's, it'll be there'll be highs and lows. I mean, like, yeah, I, we'll get a few very fun weeks, but like, I do think <laughs> this is best team, ball. I mean, isn't that the whole fucking point? Sure, but like you can say we'll get a few fun weeks from a lot of players. Yeah, and, I know, I know, you're right. And like, you know, we did. We got some like great DJ Moore weeks, but also like. We hit the stone cold nuts to get a 200 yard game out of DJ Moore. Like we very did. clear. We like, we absolutely did. I, I think and for what what happened with Justin Fields last year and DJ Moore, we got a extremely high percentile outcome because if you take away just like one of his great games, we're <laughs> we're really looking back and saying like this was a complete disaster. And Fields has not been a good passer throughout his career. Like he'd probably project similar or worse to uh, a lot of the like rookies that come in, especially like the pocket passer type of rookies. So I, honestly, I would feel fine with our fade stance if they got okay. Fields. I just like Fields hasn't shown to be a good passer at like any point in his NFL career. He's shown to have highs as a passer, but like a lot of guys have shown that they can put a good game together. I don't and think passing that, volume is a concern. He is one of those guys. Volume that, be a concern. Like, yeah, yeah, you're right. I probably feel okay, but I don't want to be fading Adams, but I don't, this is like where we have him where we think he should go like this is also you know, he's 31 years old and coming off of his worst season in like right. six or seven years like obviously it's his worst season because it was his first time not playing with like starting caliber quarterback play but like it has to be a concern that a 31 year old player is easily coming off of his worst season his worst season since 2017 by pff receiving grade by yards per route run like obviously i'm gonna blame a lot of that on he's gonna have to be play. really washed to, to ever log his worst season Again, <laughs> no, yeah, he'll never get he's, to 2015, like right? He'll never, never get say. back there. Let's, yeah, hope. luckily, no matter how bad he plays, we'll never say like it's his worst season ever. But, uh, it is, yeah, one, 1.97 yards per route run, which is good. But like, this guy has been well above two yards per route run. For I mean, ironically, year. both his PFF receiving grade and his yards per route run are nearly identical to Michael Pittman's, who we just talked about. How we're like, he's good, but can he yeah. overcome a bad situation? Obviously, we know Devontae Adams has been great but last year he was not great he was very it's the good. same archetype it's the yeah. the possession receiver plus but i mean with adams the plus is like as big as pluses get but yeah the, he he is he's getting there through dominating targets and rightfully so but yeah and on a per target basis he's not the most explosive guy mm-hmm. so the volume yeah the volume definitely matters a lot with him i think we we have yeah. him probably properly ranked like but, who would we put him over like Jalen Waddle crushed last year in all the advanced metrics he just didn't get home in terms of like the big big games which is ironic yeah Waddle's a clear team. target yeah like he's such a good good target like I'll Olave, probably write him up like I, I could I could see if you wanted to make the anti Olave case I'm not gonna do it though like Young dominates targets dominates air yards I'm not there's no one ahead of him that I'm like oh this is a clear leak. we can flip these guys no I think Olave's Olave's, you know, we have a we're slightly ahead of ADP. I think it's this feels like where he should go to me. Like we have him, you know, this is not a thing where ADP's having any kind of influence. It's just like this feels like you know, it's it's uh last year, but you're losing a little bit of that upside of like the second year guy, you know, kind of the the exponential growth of of him. Coming off this super strong rookie season, is he going to explode into like this absolute superstar? Um, he's very good, but I think that you know now I'm like now heading into his third year. I want to factor in the the team situation a little more than we did last year. We hand waved it a little bit, um, you know, like admittedly, like you kind because I think you kind of want to a little 
on the second year guys because there's just yeah like, when, just when the know. upside of talent is you're a top five talent we want to be buying top five talents almost regardless of situation yes. Yes. and that was his upside he had an incredible rookie year and all the advanced numbers and a good like good production wise too but then a year later we're like okay uh, the upside of talent it's still top five it's still good we're less, we're less likely to get there like every year that yeah, goes by right. that he isn't elite is more likely that he's not elite that he's not right than like, a Devonte adams level talent and that he's michael pittman level talent we're like at this point for i think years of michael pittman's career i have a good idea of who he is if we don't have a good idea of who chris olave is he could be something great and we want to buy when he's priced as the wide receiver 12 13 14 but every year that goes on like okay, I'm less confident that he could be great. I'm more confident that he's just plain good or very good. Yeah, yeah, I think, um, but definitely someone I want exposure to and may take a little bit more of going forward. Um, all right, let's talk the two guys that we took big stances on pre-combine, uh, uh, and I, I assume we still will. Um, Jonathan Taylor and Saquon Barkley. Those are probably the two biggest early fades that we have. Um, I'm like just not even seeing Taylor. I'm drafting off the rankings and like Taylor, it's like this is a this is a serious fade that we have on Jonathan Taylor, um, which is, you know, definitely it'll make you nervous um, because I think Taylor, the tr the tricky part with Taylor is that He's he's not going to catch any passes, and he's uh you know he, I think we now have like increasing evidence that he's going to be treated as a two down kind of running back at least maybe he's out there on third down but he's not really going to be involved a ton and their their passing volume is going to go down from last year with Anthony Richardson healthy. So then you're betting on this explosive rushing ability, but he hasn't been as explosive the last couple years there's been some mitigating circumstances there. But it becomes a little... It's just the type of bet where it's like, there's a lot of red flags now for a second-round ADP, and the path to getting to that legendary upside is a little thinner than I would like. So this is kind of the, the thoughts that lead him to being ranked at 25. The market like ex very much disagrees. He's ranked 10 spots higher by ADP. Um, but the other thing is, when you take a running back early in these rooms, huge opportunity cost. You are now, like, the first time you do it, I feel behind at wide receiver. So I do want to be generally building zero running back starts or hero running back starts. It's rare that I'm doing um, two, you know, two running backs out of the gate. And so that makes it more difficult to take Taylor. I've got this, you know mindset that basically the, the winning build right now is going to be really wide receiver heavy in the early rounds because it does dry up. Um, and so that makes Taylor even, even more difficult and obviously Barkley as well. Yeah. On the Taylor front, I think that if we're scared, it's probably we're scared of Taylor returning. Like he's that bad. He hits a double and you don't lose because other teams had extremely heavy stances of Taylor. You might've lost because you then got someone that struck out. Like one of these right. wide receivers flopped. I, I think it's almost or a bunch of them for Taylor. It's like three, four yeah. wide receivers around where we could have been taking Taylor flop. It's going to really hurt. Yeah. Taylor wins because everyone else was so poor relative. He's like surrounded by a sea of 2023 Tony Pollard's, not because he's Christian McCaffrey. He, the pass catching role is so close to zero that he really needs to, to be a runner that he hasn't been the past few years and get the touchdown luck. And again, luck. So he can get 15 plus touchdowns in a year, but these are unlikely outcomes and ceiling cases that don't kill you. And with Saquon, I don't know. I don't see many teams giving him a very significant contract. If he's back with the Giants, I'd feel good with the fade. If the Patriots give him 15 to $16 million to be their new offensive weapon, I'd feel even better about the fade. Oh my so. God. We, we, I feel nervous about how high we have them if that happens. <laughs> <laughs> Anything on these guys, Kyle? No, I mean, you kind of outlined it, especially like, I, I think, I mean, Taylor could somewhat, like, there's a very clear path to him beating us, but it's running back B's a guy who he hasn't been in the past two years, and 
at the running back position, it's very difficult to reclaim that 22 year old version of yourself. You just don't see it very often if you haven't displayed it in recent years. Honestly, I like Saquon, I feel even better about. Like, he probably has a better receiving role no matter where he goes, but he hasn't been an elite receiver in recent years. He's been the boom bust runner but without close. as many booms. Like, I, I feel even less scared of Saquon. I do think like there's a world in which Taylor has been like maligned by injuries for two years and he comes back clean and bill of health and is like five yards a carry, 300 carries, gets the touchdown luck. And we're like, dang, that hurts. He, he's not, maybe not the guy you needed, but he's up there. But like, that's a not very likely path and his only path. So I'm fine with it. Yeah. Um, Barkley has been bad as a receiver for years for years he, he the last year he had a 0 0.92 yards per out run 0.94 in 2022 1.04 1.02 in 2021 in 2020 doesn't really count because he had six receptions it was a 1.71 1.16 1 in 2019 uh which is fine and that's like you kind of getting up where it's like yeah it's not bad as a rookie, he burst onto the scene with 1.53 yards per route run, workhorse usage. That was the Barkley we were super excited about. But the receiving efficiency fell off immediately and never recovered and has gotten worse. Um, so to me, Barkley, I, I feel much more comfortable with the Barkley fade. Um, I think that the Taylor fade, the, the if you feel much more comfortable with the Barkley fade, why not raise Taylor? But it's like because it's a lot to pay. For Taylor, especially in this environment, like we mentioned with the with the wide receivers price the way they are. So I but I feel more nervous about it because the reason that I'm not getting them is because of kind of how important those early picks are, as opposed to you know, feeling like <laughs> Barkley, I'm like, I this is like a classic kind of dead zone pick. And you know, you're you're paying like the market's paying a lot for a dead zone guy and Barkley. We don't even know where he's going to play. I mean, this guy needs the volume. Like if he goes somewhere with anybody who's interesting, you know, he's been playing with like what Matt Breida and Eric, Eric Ray. Ray. Yeah. Like there's been no one to challenge him. If he goes somewhere where they have like an interesting rookie, even or second year guy, or kind of an established veteran who's solid, like Ramondre Stevenson, if you were to go to the Patriots, let's say, like that hurts like a lot. Because you're you can't really project receiving or rushing efficiency for, for Barkley at this stage. The whole bet is that he just handles all the work. I don't I don't feel great that he will, you know, because we don't know where he's gonna play. So he was what I will say for Barkley is last year he was a bit better as a rusher than he was the year before. I believe he had 93 rush yards over expected with a 37% success rate. That's not a good success rate, but Barkley's never really had a good success rate. He's kind of a boom bust runner. So that's, you know, you don't love that he had a 37% success rate. Ideally you want like 39, 40 at least. Um, but it's not the, the, it's not like a new red flag. You know, he was actually slightly better by rush yards over expected in 2022, 115 um, with a 34% success rate. So that's, that's kind of what I mean. You're just always going to get the low success rate with Barkley. But yeah, he's showing some burst as a rusher still. Um, but it's going to be this boom bust type of rushing profile, which frankly strikes me as maybe a, a future committee back. Any any thoughts? Are we are we way too harsh on on Barkley? No, I think we should go lower. No. Are we talking about well, that? really? <laughs> Like, yeah, he, so he hasn't topped three uh, yards after contact per carry, which is a fine number. But like last year, for reference, Eli Mitchell, Khalil Herbert, Isaiah Pacheco, and just under three was Zach Char Charbonnet and Tyler Algier. It's like these guys can be starters in the NFL and you're not really excited about it. Level of play. He hasn't topped that since 2019. That's the pre-COVID era of football. And that's the last time he was like meaningfully above replacement level. He's doing... Mostly the, the the bus thing when he runs and not booming nearly enough. Like, I, uh, man, I just, we're probably projecting him to be relatively inefficient. And then we don't know what the volume is going to be. Like, 
this seems like a terrible pick. Like, this seems really bad. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think I take James I think Cook over him by a mile, and I obviously we have James Cook ahead of ADP, so it's tough to like continue to push both in the opposite right. directions. But like, I take James Cook over him, I take Kelsey over him, I take Lamar over him. Yeah, I'm with everything we've said. I think that we are pretty certain that the NFL doesn't have like the NFL probably has rose colored glasses looking at take on being oh he was a top two pick in 2018 at least to some level. So I think he does have a bit more of a benefit in terms of if he's in some committee, he'll be more likely to fend it off, off like name brand respect by every account being a great teammate. But I think his ADP only makes sense of like Dave Gettleman's multi-tabling underdog drafts and CNC <laughs> and, and just like nabbing him every time is he's a prototypical dead zone back in a worse running back economy. Yeah, the... The guys for me are, you know, Cook and ETN, right? Like, and they're both, they're different types of bets. Um, but if you go down to, to ETN, um, who's got a, an ADP of 30.6, um, and we're actually behind on ETN as well. Uh, so that we're not, you know, have this big bull stance on, on ETN, but um, I think ETN situation is better. Like he's yeah. got, I, I don't really understand why the market prefers Barkley to ETN. I mean, I, I do on some level because of the name brand value and you can kind of dream on Barkley as like a total workhorse a little bit more, but ETN is coming off a pretty strong season from a production standpoint, some red flags in terms of his actual rushing efficiency and receiving efficiency for sure. But he, we know where he is and we know who his competition is. And I think he's probably a little bit protected by like the Bigsby pick last year. Like they're, yep. they don't strike me as a team who's going to be prioritizing adding a running back, you know, very weak running back class. So you're not, you're not overly worried. There would be weird if they brought someone in free agency. Um, they've got, they've got to figure out wide receiver, at, you know, who they're bringing back. If they're bringing Ridley back, if they're going to keep say Jones, if they add anyone in the draft, you think it would be more likely to be wide receiver. Anyway, he looks pretty safe in terms of his situation. And then like, yeah, he's not super efficient, but he's not bad. And he could score touchdowns on pretty good offense. Like it's a pretty good situation. And I do feel confident that he's the lead guy. Is he a little dead zoning? Yeah. <laughs> so he's a little dead zoning, but it's not so, so bad that, you know, I'm, I'm terrified of him. Um, but again, we, we are behind ADP on him. So, Weird to argue him over Barkley, who you know we're we have a Barkley above ETN in the ranks, but this is purely respecting the market because uh, if these guys flipped an ADP, we would not have to flip it mm -hmm. on the back end. We already we already have ETN ahead. It's just that the market strongly disagrees, and I think one to get kind of you know if you had a falling Barkley and you literally had the choice between Barkley and ETN, you'd take Barkley. You know, to 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 get a little bit of exposure, and also there's a lot of smart people drafting now, so we want to bake in ADP uh, to to an extent. Less we're baking it in less than we do in the summer, because um, things are more volatile. I think it makes more sense for us to kind of put our foot down on some of these stances, but um, with you know so much more information yet to come. But we are baking in ADP. Um. All right, where should we go next? The we can just talk about some of the rookies, the combine testing that's to come, how to think about that. I mean, I know Marv and Malik don't plan on testing, but Marv didn't uh, even show up, as it turns out. He didn't? It seems like see it seems like he did show up and that he was just getting medical testing when the report okay. came out that he completely <laughs> skipped the combine. Though well, they saying. said he was there, and then he missed his like interview time or whatever. But maybe it's just him for testing. <laughs> it's I think I saw a tweet saying he was just getting his MRIs and such, and it was running behind. But Good. doesn't have an agent and has been oddly quiet on all these fronts. Hmm. Um, I wanted to start with Blake Corum on the rookies. We had kind of a fade stance, not aggressively, but um, you know. He was definitely a little bit past ADP. Uh, that is no longer the case. We're now well ahead of ADP. I've just started to 
as I dig into the draft stuff, it seems like he is one of the better bets at running back to actually land draft capital. Uh, he moved up to 64 in ESPN's ranks, which generally have a pretty good uh, tie to draft capital. There were this is how I landed on the portal last year. I literally was just like, huh, scouts think this guy's second round pick and no one's taking him. I'm gonna take him. You know, it can be that simple or this early on. Quorum's now up to, you know, late second round pick, probably goes third round. But some of the other guys that we like are like Trey Benson seem a little bit riskier from a draft capital perspective than they did early. And I know all this stuff's kind of moving around and will move around a lot this weekend once we get testing. Quorum's probably not someone who's going to blaze at the combine, but um, but I do think we 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 want to respect the draft market. We definitely want to respect the respect the NFL draft market because if, I mean, if Quorum ends up going late second round to a team that needs a, a starting running back or has you know a pretty weak starter, we're going to be taking this guy fairly high, potentially very high, um, if he like hit the landing spot nuts, you know, we could be talking about him like sixth round or something, I think. So, and I don't want to take him there. <laughs> this is not something I want to do, you know, but I, he, he struck, I got a little bit of Damian Pierce vibes. Let me put it that way. I was like, I don't. And the, the big thing with Damian Pierce, his rookie year that really sucked was I wasn't taking him when he was cheap. Then I didn't take him when he was kind of, you know, middling price. And then when he got super expensive, I definitely didn't take him. And then I just didn't have any. You know, and so I think this is the time to take Blake Corman. We can get, a, we can say, let's let's account for something that is probably going to happen, but hasn't happened yet. Which you know, the market always then prices that in again when it does happen, and it looks like he's going to get solid draft position. Yeah, in a weak running back class, when you have someone who's, I think the median outcomes of. Uh pick 75 to 90 so mid to late third round pick but again that's pretty good draft capital so when you have the opportunity to take that player at a in relatively insignificant opportunity cost and it also is a nice way to balance your portfolio because i think it's extremely unlikely that quorum just goes to zero overnight like he's not getting undrafted he's almost certainly not going in rounds five six or seven so he's still going to be a very draftable player and in the ceiling outcome of I'm not even going to say the team in Los mm -hmm. Angeles with Justin Herbert under center because people are wish casting it far too often, but there are a lot of teams that need running backs in a weak class. And with a lot of free agents that we think are not very capable, very capable players. So Corum's ability to take over a backfield. And again, the point we say with basically all these running backs that are rookies, you have likely opportunities late in the season to give you extreme volume increases and, win weeks so quorum even though we might not like him as much as other running backs still has the same traits that we have to assign to every rookie i also think like, uh I, I now it's a bit in discord that every time uh i make this uh sort of point i'm just like oh he's a Jaden reed type but like if there is a path in which a player can be good like a very reasonable path and the nfl values him as such we should place an emphasis on that path and Blake Corum being bad after an ACL tear, but then the NFL sort of hand-waving away the sort of things we don't like about his profile would probably tell me they think he can be the player he was two years ago, which like that would matter with draft capital. Also, if he falls to the fifth round, I'd be like, oh, they did not think he can be that mm -hmm. player anymore. And I'd be like, we can really nuke him in the rankings. But I, I think it's, it seems like it's more likely that he's going to go earlier, at which point you can say like, oh, there's a very clear path to him beating me. He's the player he was two years ago, the ACL tear, uh, he's back fully from it and he wasn't last year. And that's why his efficiency numbers took a hit. If he is both a better prospect than his 2023 numbers show and he gets draft capital, like he, he could just ultimately be a really good pick that we miss on for sort of an obvious reason, even though I, I generally don't, I wouldn't entirely buy that narrative because we've seen other players come back strong from an ACL tear, but it's certainly a path to him beating us. That's at least realistic. Yeah, and I just I think he's going to move up in ADP most likely. So why not why not play the market a little bit? Um, this is you know, yes, I just did an episode of ADP chasing. Okay, that's uh, <laughs> that is probably why I'm thinking this way. <laughs> but uh, you know, we we were looking at the charts that Sam Sherman put together, and it was like, you know, Quorum 
I believe is on the undervalued part of the chart. And I was just thinking through like, oh, you know, I kind of feel like Trey Benson could move up. And but I was like, uh, let me let me kind of like just recheck some of this stuff and, and make sure I still have a good feel on on where these guys are, are likely kind of where the latest buzz on these guys are in terms of the draft stock. And just came away from that being like Corum could get away from us pretty easily. So not someone that you would you will have taken a lot if you've been using the rank so far. You'll get more of them. And I think we're about to go into the combine. So it feels like, well, well damn, you know, maybe, maybe not for long. But he's not someone that we expect to like just absolutely crush the combine. So this isn't like a, you know, a riser that could immediately you have no time to get. I think you'll have we'll have time because it's really about um his draft stock, which will be kind of a slow, a slow drum beat probably until actual draft day. Let's talk Xavier Worthy who is someone who could be blazing tomorrow in the 40-yard dash, um, generally testing well overall. Uh, I, it's been tough for me to, to kind of figure out these two Texas wide receivers, A.D. Mitchell, Xavier Worthy. We're ahead of ADP a little bit on both. Um, I haven't like really prioritized either guy, though, in drafts. And I don't know. They're, they're interesting profiles. They're three-year guys. Um, you know, really good program, uh, worthy, super athletic, but small. Eddie Mitchell has pretty solid size, really strong. His, his best moments are great. Kind of disappears at times. Um, doesn't have the best yards per route run. It's actually pretty poor yards per route run. Um, not super productive in terms of share of his offense and stuff, but also might be a first round early to clear wide receiver. So <laughs> There's, it's kind of like these guys have spotty profiles, but um, very, very intriguing if they are hitting their their upside. Yeah, I think Worthy's like he's got a weird profile because he broke out as a true freshman at a Power Five school, a thirty percent dominator, clear breakout, strong efficiency, and he wasn't doing it like he did later in his career, where it was a lot of like short ADOT stuff in the slot. Like I don't say gimmicky, but like easy to manufacture and stuff that we should at least consider. How does that translate? He get a 17 ADOT as a, as a true freshman. And then he, I don't want to say he like, you know, he evolved, he changed his play. They used him differently, but from his freshman to his final year, he displayed a range of different roles he could play in an offense. And he played them all either well or very well. His efficiency declined throughout his career, which is a concern. Like, obviously that's a concern, but the early power five breakout, like true 30% dominator was strong efficiency. Really hard for me to pass up on. And I, I would just straight up take him easily over AD Mitchell. Also, I think there's, I, I actually think there's a pretty good chance he outdraft capitals AD Mitchell. Mel Kuyper's latest mock had him going 32 to the Chiefs, obviously. I think there's going to be some first round buzz. I wouldn't project him going to the first round, but I think he's got a good shot to outdraft capital AD Mitchell. And I think he's got a much better profile, just overall like analytics profile than AD Mitchell. So I, I don't mind us being above on really almost any rookie, but I especially think we should have Worthy over Mitchell and Worthy as like, honestly, I'd have him as a stronger stand for us. I, fl I flipped him over him. I, I think we had him over and I flipped him back. As I've, it, this is like I said, I mean, these guys have been very tricky. And so I've been kind of torn the entire way on which way to rank these guys. Um, but I just flipped, flipped Worthy ahead of him again. Yeah, and as Kyle said, you know, it's really tough to want to be underweight in any rookies. Our default stance is unless we have many reasons for the, us to think the market's overvaluing players, they've historically undervalued given how much of these tournaments value the final few weeks of the season. Just like draft them. I mean, last year I had extreme overweight stances on Josh Downs and Jalen Hyatt in the ninth and 10th round. Those didn't work out, but they still found ways more so with downs to be productive players, even with lower ADPs. AT Perry. That's an interesting, that's such an interesting point. Sorry, the Josh Downs actually kind of paid off that ADP. Oh, yeah, I was, I was actually going to yeah. interject and say, like, I thought he paid off ADP. Yeah. yeah I mean, but I mean, the, it feels terrible because now he's an 18th round pick in, in Best Ball Mania. Yeah. But yeah, that actually yeah, kind of worked. That's one of the points with rookies and even the ones that kind of go to zero. My most drafted player last pre draft was AT Perry. And he did nothing for 15 weeks, but he got a touchdown week 17. Granted, I didn't have a team in week 17 with AT Perry. <laughs> like, if I showed the bank my exposures, he's like, oh, that's great. 
And then please, the next in line, please. <laughs> Sir, you need to stop showing me your best ball mania exposures. Your big board exposures. Excuse me, Daniel. Um, all right. Other rookies, as you mentioned, I mean, we're pretty much ahead of uh market on most of these rookies. Lad McConkey is one we've been we're okay, we're even with ADP, but it's a struggle. <laughs> struggle <laughs> with this guy. The struggle not it's, to be it's at least left. easy right now to be even on ADP with wide receiver 60. Like the cost is low, so yeah, it's okay, it's manageable. But like if he gets highly drafted and shoots up boards, that's when it'll really we probably won't be, I think. Right. But this is one I would say, like, if you see Lad near the top of the ranks, maybe click him because uh it's it it's a good time to have exposure to a you know, it, it's not a egregious price for a profile with some holes i mean you know this guy didn't have like any production in his entire career <laughs> but everyone like, loves him just just that little hole. <laughs> it didn't ever produce cooper anything cup. ever you haven't seen the yeah. cooper cup and jordy Nelson no cooper cups? cup was super productive he was just at a, at a like a d2 school yeah cooper cup is like one of the ncaa all-time leading receivers yeah like he's, almost he's a, no one has ever produced more than cooper cup he, he was he's either D2 or FCS. I want to say he might have been FCS, not D2. Yeah. But that like it's like 1400 yards season. 1400 yards season. Sorry, um, go ahead, Dan. Yeah, I don't think the drastic differences in profile has stopped the comps of Cooper Cup going to Lad Well, what was what was Hunter Renfro's production profile? Maybe comps similar to the Hunter Renfro. It was bad. So Hunter Renfro, and I know this because I was doing a dynasty draft with my buddy and he was like, we should take Hunter Renfro. And I like looked up his profile and I was like, dude, what the fuck are you talking about? Like, this guy's never done anything. He's like, listen, man, watch Clemson. He he's good. Like, he didn't get many targets or whatever, but he's like, he's gonna be, you know, he's gonna get open. He's gonna, he's gonna be exactly what Hunter. He was a hundred percent right. Hey, he was to his right. Yeah, I was gonna say credit. For like three right. years, I this this my yeah. my buddy Josh is like constantly texting me every time Hunter Renfro catches a ball. He's so the bad wide receiver of... whisperer. So what <laughs> yeah. does he think about Lad McConkey? I think that's the he probably loves him. Right? I was gonna say, he what do you think him. about the exact Nakua. same production profile? What do you think about Nakua? Because Nakua was like third year transfer, four year declare, late draft draft capital. I was like, I'm not drafting this guy, and I we ended up actually getting to where we wanted to be on him. We were above the market on him, but as a prospect, I was like, dude, I am not drafting this guy. Uh, I mean, and to Renfro's credit, he played on a murderer's row of Clemson teams with like sick wide receivers. But Puka also had uh, dominated ratings of 23%, 24%, 25%, and 23%, which is not what you want. You want a guy to be having that breakout season, um, especially as an older player, hit 30% for you. But Ladd was at 12, 20, and 16. So Mm -hmm. not close. And then the other thing with Puka um, is that his yards per route run were off the charts and not just in his final season, but throughout his career. Um, one thing I like looking at is the yards per route run only in your underclassmen years. Um, and Puka was at 3.41 as an underclassman, which is like, it, it's one of the highest marks over the last couple of years. Well, uh, Puka, Puka was, he had like 17 catches through two years. So it wouldn't like, it's cause he ran 10 routes those years. Right. No, I mean, he was a four-year player, so he would have run uh, significant routes for three years. Okay, but like his first, he did, I mean, he had 150, 168 yards his first two years. Like, Sure, okay. It's basically just... It's oh, it's like, basically one year, but he had an incredibly year, efficient... Like, he had an incredibly efficient junior year, is probably yeah, a better yeah, way to put it, yeah. Yes, correct. Um, which I really care about. I was going to say, didn't, doesn't uh, Lad McConkey do well in like the advanced stuff, like efficiency-wise... Because like you know you don't use him a ton, you don't throw to him a ton, and uh, it's easy to put up efficiency numbers. He's okay um, as an underclassman, two point three four yards per route run, which is it's not bad, uh, but it, it's not like off the charts or anything. He's also used a little bit in kind of a gadgety role. A lot of his yards after catch came um, on short targets. So anyway, he like hits a ton of red flags for me. <laughs> it's like not. This is generally a profile that I have no interest in, to be honest. But everyone loves this guy, <laughs> and the film guys love this guy, and the in the uh, NFL seems to love this guy. Um, 
and also I'm wrong on wide receivers all the time. Wide receivers are very hard uh, position to to project. So, you know, bec- and the other thing with wide receiver is it is very talent driven. So if you're wrong, if you're like this guy's not good, and then he is good, you can be really wrong about how good, <laughs> you know, and and how you can you can also be really wrong about uh, that production because if he is really good, then that's going to drive the production in a way where at running back you need to be really good and a bunch of other things to kind of fall in place. So we are even with the market on Lad Makaki. That is, that is, we are even with the market, but I can't promise we'll stay that way if he continues to rise in a big way. Yeah, his final season was good. I mean, good as in like efficient, but like the efficiency, his final season was 3.3 yards per route run. Really strong, but like, there's a reason you reference the underclassmen stuff is because like what these guys do when they're at like equal or less standing than the cornerbacks they're facing, the defense they're facing matters a lot. The longer you stay in school, the less we should sort of care about what you've done. Uh, sorry to take us on a side tangent. Georgia uh, pass catchers who uh, have at least one thing I'm concerned about. How small does Brock Bowers have to come in before we have questions? Because <laughs> like, dude, he's going to be Chico Conkle the size. Is, is he weighing in like right now, isn't he? I know. I've literally been looking it up a few times. Have you been, just, have you been watching it the whole time? Uh, like three times. I think I've updated uh, just the Twitter search of Brock Bowers because <laughs> it has it in my history now. Three times. I haven't seen a wait for it. Nothing? Like, oh, man. Oh, wait. Is it... uh, Underdog just posted it. Uh, I think he's 6'3", 243. Oh, I'll take that. Yeah. That's not six, bad. Three, it's... Six, I will three, take one, that. Eight. Yes, yeah, he's he's. I I thought he was gonna get a six two and change rounded up to six three, but he got like officially over six three, over two forty. He's not big, but like that's enough. It's enough. Well, for that's me enough. To that's enough. This is my this concern is because... was under six three, under two forty, which I think literally like he was listed at like two thirty seven and like six three flat. So yeah, I was I was worried like six two two thirty one. Yeah, yeah, that was my concern. Uh, I'll take six three two forty. Yeah, uh, forty for sure. Um. So feel good about our Bauer stance now that he's not the smallest tight end to ever go in the first round. And Danny Kelly's got the tweet out, Sam Laporta, 6'3", 245. Nice. Uh, We're back. 32 and an eighth inch arms, 10 and a quarter inch hands. Bowers, 6'3", 243, 32 and three quarters inch arms, and uh, 9.75 inch hands. So a little smaller hands, but not small hands. So that, you know, we're we're there. I think we're good. I feel good about the Bowers weigh-in. Um, now now hopefully hopefully he tests well. In general, well maybe do you want to talk Bowers? Actually, it's a we we got the information on his weight that that you know was probably going to be the biggest thing that would swing him. Um, we've had a bull stance, so it's nice to see that he, you know, isn't super super small. Yeah, feel. Good. I feel better now. I think this was a better than median weigh-in and height for yeah. Bowers after photos came out of him looking five foot eight. So wins a win. Dude, we gotta we gotta fix this Brock Bowers haircut, man. It's it's time to yeah, it didn't help. It, it's, it, it's the type of haircut that will make you pretty nervous if <laughs> full stands on Brock Bowers in early best ball drafts. Have um, you been listening to his interviews? He he hates answering questions. So he'll give two to three word answers. Oh, that's good. Easy. That's we like that's that. Good. We like yeah. that. Yeah, this, okay. that sounds like a guy who likes to run block, you know? Yeah, he exactly. Want, he doesn't yeah. want to talk. He's better. I don't think He's run block business. is very loquacious, you know? <laughs> <laughs> I would be a bad run blocker. <laughs> That's the only reason, though. It's just, you know, you're sort it's of just talking. That. Yeah, I'm sure the Your Venn diagram. Your technique is good. Your technique is good. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure the Venn diagram of fantasy podcasters and good run blockers is far from a circle. <laughs> it's just two separate circles, Yeah. <laughs> Dang, we um, even have Austin Eckler as a fantasy podcaster. He's not a good runner. <laughs> <laughs> still, yeah, <laughs> more of a runner. I mean, get get the guy. You know, put the ball in his hands. Okay, <laughs> that, that's that's uh, that's how you use Austin Eckler. Um, all right. Any other? I mean, Brian Thomas is right here. Do we want to talk about Brian Thomas and Troy Franklin a little bit? These are guys that we think are going to blaze tomorrow. Um, how much of that do you feel like is already kind of baked in? I yeah, think I mean, not already baked in. I, I so think when he so when the forties of... come in on like Thomas and Franklin, should we not? Well, the thing is with Franklin, like we we can just sit tight because we have him ranked so far ahead of ADP that like mm-hmm. we don't need to adjust. <laughs> we can let the market come to us. 
on Franklin. It already has by like 15 picks, I think. Um, but I think there's still room to the upside there. Robinson is the guy. I've definitely been trying to take more of Robinson. Right. He could blaze and then rise up in ADP. He probably shouldn't, though, because the, the NFL is already assuming this guy is super fast. Yeah, I mean, if we look at 40-yard dash props, which I've been doing possibly a concerning amount, but Brian Thomas Jr. has a 4.44. <laughs> Troy Franklin has a 4.36. And though it's a soft wow. market, I think those are pretty accurate. I probably think yeah, they were, would they were not break. accurate at all four or five days ago when they dropped, but like I know people have annihilated the bad ones. So I think anything that's out right now is at least like ballpark, correct? Yeah, and I think you're looking at somewhere in the four fours for Brian Thomas. I think high four threes for Franklin, not really betting into a four three six. Not not that I can legally bet 40 yard dash props across the pond, sadly, because you know they hate fun over here. But I think we're getting somewhere in the four threes, high four threes for that Troy is Franklin. kind of the reputation, isn't it? <laughs> the, yeah. It's like crazy Americans over here <laughs> betting 40 yard dashes. Oh, uh, I was um, explaining last night to my friends when I was watching the Chop Robinson 40 what it meant. They were shook, discouraged, haunted. You had to explain to them Cleve too, because you had to explain that where his prop opened was different and that the Cleve mattered because he he middled the two lines. It was that's uh, like a healthy lifestyle. I'm sure everyone loves it. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but like, yeah, Troy Franklin, I don't think there's a time that's realistic for him to post that changes my mind. Ryan Thomas, like if somehow he snuck into the four threes, like maybe we could adjust, but I don't think it's. If Franklin good. ran four or five, it would change my mind. Oh, that's true. I guess they could. I was thinking about the good <laughs> outcomes. You're right. I wasn't thinking about the bad outcomes. Yeah. We yeah. are baking in a pretty fast 40. Like what point, yeah, yeah. what is the line for you where you go? Yeah, I have a lot of Troy Franklin. What, I, mean, what I think we're, we're more concerned with Troy Franklin's weight. If he comes in, yeah, yeah, that's true. Shockingly close to what I weigh, I would be a little horrified given that he's a uh, probably an early round two wide receiver and one with a very good profile. So weight, I think is the big question mark with Franklin. I agree. Cause like, man, he, he's fast. <laughs> like he's definitely fast. It's just the way yeah, the, the 40 time, it would literally have to be like high four fours or four five for me to say like, yeah, yeah, he plays. Like, I agree. He looks like he runs a four three seven, and he like that's how he plays. And he just tested at four three. Like the delta between those two, I can explain by like it's the com it's it's the combine, it's the underwear Olympics. The difference between that doesn't change what we saw in the numbers and what we saw in the film. Like a four four nine, I'd be like, oh, maybe there is something we should check in. But I don't think it's particularly realistic. Uh, and and yeah. roughly the same is true of Brian Thomas as well. And. Uh, yeah, it's the, really for for Franklin. It's the weight, honestly. Like, dude, yeah. take a slower forty time. Like, run a four four two or whatever if you can put on weight to, to you know at the cost of a little bit slower. Yeah, I mean, I remember times. last year quickly Jalen Hyatt was projected to run a like four two eight four two nine, and then he came in at four four zero. So those are some of the calls for concerns. Where if you're extremely confident in speed, then they're over a tenth different than the expectation. And then the weight isn't shockingly different. You probably should have some like signals going off in your head that you might want to reconsider. So you have to also always be remembering to weight adjust these 40s because if they come in better than expected on weight, you probably want to then slide your 40 scale expectations a bit. Yeah. I mean, if he came in like if he ran a 4 4 flat at like 187, let's go. If he runs mm -hmm. a 4 4 at 175, <laughs> oh God. You know, that's, that's exactly what Jalen Hyatt did, I think. Yeah, <laughs> right. So that's that's the you you really if he's below 180, we really need that speed to be there. Um, just purely for draft capital, right? Like Troy Franklin falls to the third round. That's going to that's we're not going to feel great about where we were drafting him. He's kind of the mm -hmm. Josh Downs where like maybe he still pays it off, but yeah. it's it's, you know, we're going to be eating a, a big loss in terms of. uh you know, the, the ADP. Uh, yeah, I think Downs, I, Downs is a good comp because with Downs, he ran, I think, a very nice 40, but his weight was concerningly low. And Hyatt came in at an expected weight, but a slow 40. So you see how both elements can really tank your draft stock because both guys were projected early to mid-second rounders and fell to the third. So Roman Wilson is someone that I want to mention. He's actually quietly, I think, could... Could like do really well at the combine. Um, he's like, uh, I believe he has a track background. Um, I believe so too, yeah, yeah, it's and not it's kinda, 
He has yeah. a 433 40-yard dash prop. He should. I was going to say, I thought his props were really strong, or at least his 40 prop, but the projections for his, like, short shuttle stuff, too, were really good. I don't know. I just don't – I don't hear him talked about as, like, this, like, kind of hyper-athlete. Maybe uh, maybe, uh, maybe my perception of the perception is just off. <laughs> but, like, he kind of, for a while there, was, like, more of, like, the, you know, interesting – um, you know, route runner type type dude. I mean, he he honestly, he's just starting to look like a just a straight riser because he's he crushed the senior bowl. He was getting open at will, and he may be about to crush the combine. So he would be if you don't have any Roman Wilson, uh, and you're listening to this Friday, he doesn't run till tomorrow. So <laughs> <laughs> you know, get some drafts in maybe. Um, yeah. but we've we've been he's not he's an interesting one, right? Because Troy Franklin, we've been ahead of ADP on the entire time. It's because the initial rank that we had for Troy Franklin was like, I mean, it's probably still, I think it was probably in the 70s is where I just slotted him in. Um, and and so, the, you know, the, yeah, his his rank is is like 73. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, it there's a, you know, obviously you don't want to take him there because you now you're just like giving up a ton of, um, opportunity to get him later, and you're, if you're taking a guy exactly where you have him valued, then what if you're wrong? That stinks. So take your discounts. But it has been easy for us to let the market to come to us because we haven't really been raising Troy Franklin on positive news. We kind of had just been really bullish on him the whole way. Roman Wilson has not been the case. We we never were fading, I don't think. But like maybe early on, we weren't like suggesting that you hammer him. But I remember around when he was going in the 180s, feeling like we need to get ahead of this. This dude looks really interesting. He doesn't check all the boxes in terms of the production profile stuff. It's a little lad. Um, but he, I think at this point, probably has the better draft capital projection than Lad McConkey. Um, he's been going in round one in some drafts. I think that's very unrealistic. I think he's probably a round two pick, but he also passes all the vibes tests. When he was playing in Hawaii, he'd like fly from one island to another to like get to school to play football Wait, and say, say this what are you saying yeah i'm pretty sure the ringer did a piece where he would fly from one island to another at like 4 a.m just to play to football I, w- I believe it was also to go to school i'll do some big j journalism as you can fill the time <laughs> okay i like that i like where you're headed this is a, a i love this narrative um but i'll also mention um he had a 38 percent dominator rating in his final season at Michigan, which was in his fourth year. So it's not, you know, you'd prefer that as an underclassman, but if you're betting on a, an older prospect, I really do prefer that they were productive, you know, at some point. And he was at least. So, um, but I think just a case where like draft capital, some of the stuff that, you know, we know is important, but you know, like the production profile is not going to change. It's not great. But all the other stuff is starting to look better and better. So, you know, want to be ahead. And this is like one reason I've had trouble with with drafting Lad McConkey. To be honest, is I'm like Roman Wilson seems like he might get drafted higher, and it's kind of a better version of a similar profile in my mind. Um, and you can, and now it's starting; it's getting closer to converging. But there's been a long stretch here where you could get Roman Wilson at a pretty big discount, and I think you. Maybe still can for you know another day, but if he crushes the combine, that's that's going to change. Oh yeah. yeah, this flying story is true. In high school, he went to school on a different island than he lived on, so he'd wake up at four a.m. to fly to a different island to go to school. The school at which he played football. My assumption is he chose that school for football purposes. But uh, man, that's insane. That's going to come up in an interview and boost his. So draft. we're talking like when you say fly to a different island, we're talking like prop plane, right? Like th- uh, no, like- so, okay, so actually the, the story goes on. His uh, his dad was, I believe it says his dad was a pilot, so he would fly on like the standby seats, as in we have an open uh, seat oh, okay. On, a, okay. on an actual airline. Yeah. But that also meant he didn't always know he was going to be able to go. <laughs> That's true, yeah. Be flying standby. I mean, damn, dude. That is, yeah. uh, that's some cool. dedication. Yeah. Yep. This was picked up on by a few places in, I think, early February, and I thought that, oh, the media's like, or the draft markets are going to catch hype with this because that's something that everyone's going to love bringing up. Like, I feel like that's Aminra ask with the way he would talk about, yeah, knowing all the receivers oh. ahead of him. Yeah, yeah, so, that is very Aminra ask. Yeah, yeah. So 
we're one of the few sites that's factoring in did he fly to high school <laughs> in our rankings because the market has yet to do so. Yeah. Airline miles per route run. No one's <laughs> no one's higher than Roman Wilson. He was um, 14 years old. Imagine telling 14 year old yourself you're getting up at 4 a.m. I, I I would I simply would not. No. <laughs> I remember I remember. Like, cause I, I like ran cross country and we would go, I, you know, I grew up in Delaware. You go up to like New York or something for a race. Right. So you got to wake up pretty early. And I think, but I think it was only like five in the morning. And I remember, I like remember waking up that early being like, Oh God, cause it was on a Saturday and everything. So it like, that was one time. <laughs> you know, <laughs> now, Pat, imagine doing that every day, and then I think it said specifically on the weekends is when it was uh, dicey if you get a flight. Imagine waking up for your co- cross country race, and your dad's like, "Sorry, all the seats in the car, but go back to bed." <laughs> <laughs> Come on, Dad. Yep. <laughs> your brother needs a seat. You got to wait for the next one. <laughs> That's why we're here talking about fantasy football, and he's going to be around right. two drafted. All right. I'm gonna go in the sheet and boost them up like two rounds. I know. I no, I'm excited. I mean, we're we're 12 picks ahead of ADP, so uh you will see him in the ranks. Um, but yeah, I think I think the market may come to us on this if he if he tests like we expect. Um let's see. Anyone else before we uh, Michael Wilson down. If we're gonna be if we have one of these Wilsons ranked higher, it's definitely Roman. Michael Wilson's uh it's a real do nothing fella. <laughs> Do we know how? I mean, Jonathan Gannon had the whole monologue about like if you took the if you drove or took the bus to work, he didn't even ask his players if they flew to work. So I think that <laughs> if we can get that information, then we can really <laughs> fine tune the process. That's true. That's true. We we <laughs> we're always gonna be grinding for these small edges, guys. Don't worry. Um, let's talk the quarterbacks. That's that's a, a good way to close out here. Um, Drake May, Jaden Daniels. Uh, we've been really excited about Drake May, but also ahead on Jaden Daniels, and I believe we're ahead on Caleb Williams as well. Yeah, we're 8.5 picks ahead. So all three guys we're, we're excited about, um, but we're the most excited, and, and I'm very excited about Drake May. Um, he's the cheapest. I think he actually has the best profile for scoring fantasy points because I think you can put this guy in more of a high volume, you know, for a rookie passing offense. He's all, he's very mobile. He's much more mobile around the goal line than I think Jaden Daniels. I mean, every, you know, you hear Jaden Daniels like, man, he's going to be a force as a rusher between the 20s. <laughs> it's like, it's like not, he's not going to be someone who scores, I think, a ton of short rushing touchdowns. Um, he's, he's slender. May is not. May ran for a bunch of touchdowns. He, he his touchdown rate was almost twice as high as Justin Herbert's in college. Um, this dude was looking to play make around the goal line. Probably uh, it's probably one of the reasons you know guys are getting a little nervous about him because he is he will go hero ball. But I like hero ball. Uh, hero ball scores fantasy points. Interceptions aren't worth like like if if NFL teams created fantasy scoring, interceptions would be worth like minus 30, 30 <laughs> points. But they're not. They're like minus two. Sometimes they're minus one. So I, I'm willing to live with them. Um, some fumbles too. I think May is going to be uh, just a very exciting, fun fantasy quarterback. Pretty much wherever he goes, I guess the Patriots would be a bummer. But he's someone that's been uh, like a key part of my early drafts. Almost to the detriment of my Daniels and Caleb Williams stances, though. And I, I don't want to be out on those guys. Um and, you know, as you can see, we're ahead of both on the ranks. So what were your thoughts on probably more Daniels in May? Um, curious for any Caleb Williams thoughts you have. But those are the two that have been more kind of in the the news as like the draft capital conversation. It kind of seemed like it was flipping to Daniels as, as the quarterback, too. But now maybe going back to May as the quarterback, too. Where are you guys at on those two? Yeah, this is a very interesting quarterback two race. I think we can write Caleb Williams in one. Yeah. probably with Sharpie sure. at this point. It's 95 to 98%. He'd have to have a Laramie Tunsil-esque video come out <laughs> of doing a far harder substance. But with <laughs> Jaden and May, I think that there was initially, by initially past few weeks, a lot of smoke on Daniels and teams liking him. Daniel Jeremiah even said he thinks the number one pick has a 20% shot to be Jaden Daniels. 
I do not believe that. Wow. But the, <laughs> there's sentiment like that. The PFF Stock Exchange which has been a really good resource with Trevor Sigma and Connor Rogers either today or last night, their combine rumor episode. Connor said he talked to two teams that had Daniels as QB2. One of them was picking way far away, so it wasn't an issue. Again, I don't know how many teams he talked to that then had May QB2, but I think it's undecided currently as to like, we don't know who the QB2 is. I think the commanders know who their QB2 is, so we'll see, and it's really hoping. Ideally, neither goes to the Patriots. In reality, one yeah. probably goes to the Patriots, but if you're told that ADP is in the 10-11 turn and then the 12-13 turn, one of those guys is quarterback in the commanders, you'd feel really good having a large pile of that quarterback, even if it came at the expense of someone like a sacrificial lamb going to New England. Yeah, and I like, I, you know, I'm definitely bummed if May or Daniels ends up in New England, but I don't think that's like, you know, the end of it. It's not as good as it could have been, you know, but it's like they're not good and they're going to have to pass. <laughs> and it's so like, it's not going to be super efficient, but like maybe that means Jaden Daniels runs even more. You know, or maybe that means May is constantly scrambling around and, you know, it's like it's a headache for his coaches at times, but he's also making really cool plays to um, I, I don't know who I have no idea who it would actually be to. But, you know, he could maybe they draft someone down and, you know, it's he's connected cool plays to pop Douglas. I'm really excited for those ones. <laughs> Third round lad McConkey. Very. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, listen, everyone's uh, loves this guy, so go go change the New England franchise, lad. Prove prove it. Prove you got it. Um, I, I'm no Bill Belichick had him with a real pristine grade, just the Wes Welker, Danny Amendola comp. I was going right to say, he's, he's got that Cole Strange, you know, delta between actual draft grade and his draft grade on, on Lab McConkey. <laughs> uh, yeah. Well, you know, because the Patriots obviously is bad. You know, yeah. it's just, it's a tough situation for a rookie quarterback, but <clears throat> I think you'd be probably more nervous about it from a dynasty perspective. Cause it's like, man, this guy could like, this is the type of situation where a guy could actually just flop. But I do think it's not like they're going to have to, it's not like there's quarterback competition or that they might, you know, get uh red shirted or something. Yeah. They won't. So that would be the type of disaster outcome that would be really concerning. Honestly, in a sense, the worst case scenario for these guys, and probably May more than Daniels, is the Giants. Absolutely, I was going to bring that up. So, yeah, why don't, why don't you why don't you talk about that? Yeah, I mean, the Giants have been steadfast in their publicly facing commitment to Daniel Jones. They also have an incredibly easy out in Jones's contract after this season with very little dead cap and with the way the cap went up more than expected. The Giants won't really have to restructure Jones and it won't preclude, preclude them from looking at quarterback early. And if that's the case, they're probably going to ride with Jones, assuming he's healthy week one, which all signs point to, until they're eliminated from the playoffs. And then they'll play a rookie if they have one. And then you're really looking at very few games for these players. If they mm -hmm. go to the Patriots, they're starting week one. And unless they get hurt, they're starting every week of the year. Billy's we joke happy. about the weapons, but like they will have someone. And honestly, like if he, they got they drafted Lad McConkey in the second round, like good. Like at least, like at least you're bringing in some someone, you know. And maybe you're look. I didn't think Rasheed Rice would be very good, and he was. So you're you're bringing in weapons for the rookie quarterback. I, that's going to happen. They have to. They have to. They draft a guy number three overall. They have to add weapons. Um, so it won't look as dire as it does now. It's still not a good outcome. But yeah, I mean, not playing. It's a weird thing where like if I, from a dynasty perspective, I'm excited about Drake May. So I would actually like him to go to the Giants. Right? They that probably buys Dayball and Shane another year after this year, right? To develop the rookie. Yeah. If if May flashes, if May looks pretty promising. You got the Dayball, Josh Allen development story that's going to be, you know, everyone's kind of top of mind at that point. So now you're heading into 2025 with Brian Dayball's, you know, big mobile starting quarterback who flashes a rookie. That dude's going high in super flex drafts. 
Like he he will go very high. So you feel really good about May going to the Giants from a dynasty perspective, but from a best ball perspective, it almost ruins it. Like like these are like it's a bad it's a bad pick at that point um, where he's been going because you almost don't have that quarterback. <laughs> like you better have a really good quarterback one. Um, you know, who can just, you know, you better have like Jalen Hurts or someone who's just week in, week out filling that starting lineup for you because um, you like literally don't have a quarterback too. So, I, I mean, how realistic do you think a slide like that would be, I guess, because that's, that could really change this. I mean, I think the Giants are somewhere between 10 and 30% to take a quarterback at six or via move up. But I think a large portion of that is JJ McCarthy. Yeah. So I'm not, Right. Factoring in too much with Maine Daniels, I know there's downside risk there. I think that given their upside, their worthwhile selections, the Giants would be a devastating landing spot for either. But it's such a minuscule outcome that I don't think it's worth avoiding them. JJ McCarthy is someone we have not really had high in the ranks, and it's partly for that reason is that he could end up sitting a year and he's another guy the way in is important for he could be like he could be like 199 yep and you know what that means 203 sports ref had him at 197 i'm gonna guess they i mean i'd bet anything they find a way to get him over 200 uh but like it's possible (laughs) nice cream right now oh he is uh i think um uh, Rob, I don't remember how to say his last name. It's always sunny when he got fat for like the middle seasons. <laughs> yeah, okay, said yeah. he would let the ice cream thaw and drink it at the end of the day <laughs> for, for weight adding purposes. Did they've got McCarthy on that diet? I'm sure. I'm sure Jaden Daniels, who <laughs> is not uh, doing, I don't think he's doing anything at the combine. Uh, same way, like just show up thick, buddy. Yeah, they just call Rob McElhenney and be like, "Give us your 10,000 calorie diet for one season of It's Always Sunny. We need the one day version." Yep. Well, Michael oh, Henney got jacked later, so he could actually give dietary advice on both That's sides. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you need the weight. You need the, do you need the fat Mac or the cut Mac? Yeah. <laughs> which, which Mac are you looking for here? <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, if he's if he's not 200, it's a huge red flag because you know he's trying to get to 200. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Those are the situations that I think are so improbable because when you have these clear thresholds of how bad it would right. be, you're then telling the player you're yep. gaining this and you're doing no other drills because <laughs> you are just going to like get a stamp saying I weigh 207 pounds on this day and then you'll yes. run your 40 the next day. So right. though I right. think McCarthy is expected to run, which probably is a good sign that he doesn't have to gain so, so many pounds that would disrupt That's his true, athleticism. Yeah. That's a good point. Yeah. And I say this so, before he actually runs the 40. So <laughs> it's just he just shows up as fat Mac and just bombs the 40. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what happened, guys. I I felt really good about the way in. <laughs> I'm well over 200 now. <laughs> it's like 215. You, you can tell he's been he's been chugging. But are you guys like? How do you feel on McCarthy? Because this is one of the few rookies we actually have a, a pretty clear fade stance on, and yet you know it's all he's the buzziest guy in the whole draft. Um, but for me, it's that you know he could end up going high and still be in a situation that's not that great for year one mm-hmm. fantasy production, and then he's a low volume college passer to an extreme extent. Um, he's a small guy. He is mobile. But I don't know, like, as a rookie that he's going to be adding a ton with his legs. Um, Some, but I don't think it's going to be, like, difference-making for fantasy. Um, And I would bet he's in a low-volume passing offense as a rookie. So it's, like, kind of the what-do-you-win-when-you-win thing. And then, like, there's also, like, redshirt risk, I think. Especially, like, we talked the Giants thing. Like, he's probably the most likely of all the quarterbacks to go to the Giants. And just such an obvious redshirt candidate behind Daniel Jones. Like, it... It's like very logical. Yeah, I think there's a lot of spots for him to be a redshirt candidate. Like Vikings bring back Kirk Cousins, but he falls to them. They could take him. Like the Broncos are forced to sit on the Russell Wilson contract because there's no takers. I can't. Okay. I don't think they can because they it guarantees they're they're, they have to cut him or or his 25 salary guarantees. Oh, his 25 guarantee. I thought he just yeah. had 24 stuff. No, it guarantees if they keep him, so they have to cut him. 
Uh, but yeah, like he's like, I think of all the quarterbacks, he is by far the most likely to not play a lot, if not all of his rookie year, or at least all that we care about. So, and right now, He's priced at a point where if he rows 40 picks, he goes to the Falcons and he goes 40, 50, 60 picks ahead. You're like, okay, because. in super or in a, like an auction draft, he went from being really undrafted, but let's say undrafted to one dollar, three dollars or whatever yeah. max. Like that's the max he could rise. I really don't care. But the the loss scenario is that you've got a dead roster spot, and that loss scenario is fairly likely, especially for a portion of the season. So I think right now it's just a very obvious bet where like. I'm fine letting the market uh, jack up his ADP a lot because he hardly has an ADP right now. Who cares? Like, why take the risk now when we know there are players going around him who for sure will contribute something? They'll be on the field running routes or they'll be their team's number two running back, something like that. Or, I mean, there's dudes right above. They get this this tier here. Javon Baker, someone I moved up recently that we didn't have uh, very high in the ranks, but he's kind of interesting. And I think the draft capital. Yeah. So there's like a, there's literally guys where I'm like, Oh man, I'm kind of sleeping on this guy a little bit. We need to get him up. And, um, there's like, that's happened like five or six different times with different players. You know, like that's this, this draft class is very deep. I I think at wide receiver, I think there are going to be some home runs in this class, you know, like Jill McMillan, like he's, you know, he, he was injured his last year. It's kind of like the black box. The the draft capital, though, might be pretty good. And, like, could he be awesome? Like, yeah, he could. I, he also might not be very good at all. But, like, there, I think you want to use those final picks, especially in a draft class like this, to take real swings. And McCarthy could be a nice player that helps you advance. Um, but I don't know. It doesn't strike me that he's going to be this massive hit. So... Yeah, even I'll even the loss scenario I mentioned that, was like, but... what if they beat us on closing line value? It wasn't even, yeah, what if yeah. they beat us with a ton of fantasy points? My big, quote, disaster was like, he jumps 40 picks, we got to draft right. him at it. Like, I don't see him crushing us in terms of actual fantasy production. I see him disappointing our, our bear stance by like, oh, he plays all the games and, he, and he's good. Like, that would be not great, but honestly, it'd be fine. Like, who cares if you miss out on like the QB 17 uh, and you still take some of them later when he's a little more expensive. It's fine. Yeah, I think importantly, we're not going to be necessarily anti-McCarthy once we get through the draft. We just would like to know where he goes because... Yeah, I would like in, to know. In somewhere like half of the outcomes, he's going to be unjust. Like you can't draft him because he's a clear red shirt. And if he then is in the 50% of, oh, this is a fine pick, the ADP doesn't really matter. At that point in the draft, you're just like taking him in round 14 instead of round 18. And then it's, I sack, I made sure I didn't have to burn a roster spot in any pre draft because it was overwhelmingly possible that I would have a dead roster spot had I taken him. So stay at zero now, buy later if he's going to not get redshirted. Yeah. And I, it's one of those ones where sometimes if you don't take a guy and then he moves up in price, you're like, man. I really missed out there. Could have this huge bag. They've been so fun. I really don't feel that way with McCarthy, even if I end up hammering him in best ball mania. There are scenarios. Like, let's say he goes to the Cardinals. Or, sorry, not the Cardinals. The Falcons. Different bird. Different different red <laughs> team with the bird. Uh, he goes to the Falcons. Um, He's going to rise a lot in price. But, okay, I take him in the 13th, 14th round. That's not prohibitive. You know, and, and he might be more like 14th, 15th. And you probably, you know, you're going to be able to get plenty of JJ McCarthy at a price that doesn't feel egregious. And at that point, I'm like going to start every game. Might not be the highest volume guy, but has good weapons, you know, can be efficient. If he's good, we're going to be, you know, he's in a, an offense that should be able to take advantage of what he does well, uh, should have good pass protection, like all the things. He's not, he doesn't have the profile where he's going to become an eighth or ninth round pick. He just doesn't. So you're going to go ahead and get him. I don't know if he moves up, he's going to be at the 12th round at the, at the highest. Like it's just not going to be prohibitive. And so at that point, I would be happy with a ton of new information. I mean, 
a specific landing spot that's basically like the best possible outcome. Um, that is, you know, like I'm I'm still gonna be glad that I waited for that information to materialize, and then I will pounce with that information in hand. All right, guys. I think that'll do it. We we uh we should be back soon to discuss more. Uh these rankings, by the way, available at legendaryupside.com. If you're drafting in uh the big board streets, would recommend uh signing up for the site you can download them upload them to underdog draft right off them uh adp is baked in so you're not going to be wildly divergent from from adp i've been drafting off them the entire off season i i find it quite enjoyable so um would recommend checking those guys out and yeah we'll be back reasonably soon with another podcast we're going to have to shake up these rankings as soon as the combine ends. So I think we'll kind of be back and, and give you our thoughts on, on where things land post combine. Um, but yeah, Kyle, any, uh, anything to tell people about or Daniel, anything you want to shout out before we go? No, check out the Roto world pod. We talked some pre combine stuff as well. Uh, on the Roto world pod, we'll probably have a fallout. We had Froton on. That was some good. He actually had a really oh. good breakdown. We had a, he had a really good breakdown. Of, I, I'm halfway uh, through that. That was fun. Did you? Uh, he was on, I think, the first half when we got to other stuff in the second half. His stuff on AD Mitchell and Xavier Worthy is why I brought it up for our. Oh, podcast. I haven't, I haven't gotten to that part yet. Yep, yep, that was really good, and so is his Keon Coleman stuff. So the the AD Mitchell Worthy stuff is like the whole point of why I brought it up here is because I had just gotten a good, good little cache of information from Froton. So check that out for sure. Froton won uh, the College Football Writer of the Year, right? Yes, he did. Yeah, congrats to him. Froton is super, super sharp. So yeah, definitely check out that episode. I'm excited to finish it. Um, all right. We will see you guys later. Thanks so much for watching. Thanks so much for listening. And uh, enjoy the combine.